Hi there, thanks for joining me for another episode of Draw, Make, and Code. I'm your host, Ed Cavett, and in this episode, we're going to be making a long-form generative system using a particle grid. Now, particle grid is a very powerful tool in generative art, and I'll talk about that later in an upcoming episode about process structure. But for now, here's the code to make a particle grid, and then you can discover different relationships and, and plot geometries that will graph those relationships in all kinds of different ways. The variety of output that you can get from a particle grid system is absolutely stunning. If you want the code, this is available at GitHub and a, and a link in the description and also in the browser. Let's look at the steps that are involved in making this. We take the canvas and we divide it into some portions. This is a nine by nine grid. That's arbitrary. You can set those values to anything you want. You can make it uniform or have some aspect ratio whatever your heart desires. Just so long as we have each area, each proportion, is assigned to a location that's held in an array. So now we can move through an array, a set of values that will describe each one of these locations. Once we have those areas, those proportions, then we can start doing stuff inside them. We could treat each one as a canvas. So imagine you have some mover inside each one of these proportions. Here in this example, we have a circular mover and it can be attenuated using some noise or some kind of modifier. So they're offset a little bit and they're not rotating in unison. So you get some maybe stylistic or random motion out of these. Then you can look at the, the relationship of any group of those, maybe by distance and join them with lines use the vertices to make lines and then you can use the interior uh, dimension of that shape that's generated to create uh, these geometries like the triangles and the quadrilat quadrilaterals and then by uh, adjusting the graphics attributes and layering the output you can get all kinds of neat things to happen so that's what's going on in this program so let's start coding we're going to open a new sketch in p5.js we're going to declare a variable to hold our object and then in setup we're going to use the available window width and window height and we need to remember to instantiate a new object and give that to the variable we declare. Uh, in then in draw, real easy, we're going to execute the update function. That's pretty much all there is for setup and draw. Uh, remember to do the <laughs> little thing that I forgot there. Uh, next we're going to start our function. Now this function might look a little bit familiar. If you watched a previous episode, the procedures are very much the same. We're creating nodes that go from left to right, top to bottom, and we're going to be treating each one of the areas around those nodes as a little canvas. That's like the previous episode. And then it's the relationship between all of those little canvases that something emerges out of it that's interesting. In this, we're adding something to it. Now we're, we're going to be doing that same thing with the nodes. We're going to be drawing something in each one of those canvases and each one of those canvases is going to have some relational output. But we're also adding to it a mover that's going to be stepping through the nodes randomly and picking, it's like picking a random node. And then it's going to look around that node and see what's close by. And if there's something close by, it's going to uh, draw a line between. It's going to create a vertex. So we're, we're developing a shape table for the relationships between these locations. Then at the end, we're going to uh, recall that shape and fill it and whatever enclosed areas there are, those will create some geometry. And where they overlap, that's going to create some interesting layering. And if we adjust the graphics attributes to allow that layering to be visible, like we have low alphas, then it gets really interesting as it goes over and over and over again. It's eventually going to oversaturate, so you have to have something in there that will take output away, but it's not going to take it all the way. So you can see that there's black that occurs. It's it's solid black. It's not alpha. So it, it that's figured by some coin flip, some certain threshold, depending on how much you want to remove each time, and that's going to give you the degradation in the output that keeps it from oversaturating. So that's kind of a clue to what you can do to get that output to stay long form. So that's what this is a long form generative system. 
you want it to run for a long period of time and you want the output in between to be interesting at any given point more to the point of long form generative design you want those outputs to be fairly unique so it doesn't do much good to have a long run of output and almost all of it looks the same it's indistinguishable this is one of those that the output pretty much looks the same no matter what you might get some interesting really interesting ones on occasion but by and large it's pretty much the same style of output and one looks pretty much like the other if you're patient and you you watch it and you can curate the output you can get some things that are more compelling than others so that's kind of in the realm of long form gender design really the goal of long form gender design is to have as many um, uh, viable or um, compelling mints as you can possibly get out of it that's that's the idea but that's a really challenging thing and uh, knowing the principles of design and applying those to your procedures is going to help achieve that so a lot of tweaking is going on here where I'm adding modifiers. I have uh, modifiers that work for cosine and sine. So it's basically describing the circle like I talked about earlier. And then I have a modifier that uses noise. So now the noise is being applied to modify the circle. So now you get like this little wobbly circle. So you have this wobbly location that's around the node. And every once in a while it's going to wobble out of range and it's going to wobble in range if I'm testing a, a distance between nodes. So say I pick a random node and I say, let's look at all the nodes that are two to three times distance away. And those location values, because they're moving in circles, might move away and it won't create a line there. And then maybe you'll test again later on and it's closer to the, the test and now there's a line there. So you're getting this a strange sort of stochastic that comes out of the location and testing and it's moving in and out of these possible true locations into false locations and it creates all this really weird kind of messed up output but it's messed up in a way that you can see some uniformity or some pattern in it so it's really skirting the edge it's finding the intersection of chaos and uniformity and this is probably one of the most compelling aspects of generative art is that you can skirt that edge. It seems like the closer you get to the intersection of those two things, the more compelling your art will be because the audience is left wondering, is there a pattern there? It looks like there is, but it also looks very organic and uh, just kind of disorganized in a way. And that's all deliberate. And you can also add distress to the output by having some uh, procedure in there that will take away stuff just like I do with the black that takes away a geometry uh, randomly you can add like little specks of things that will remove part of the output in kind of a dirty sort of way in, in graphics it's called grunge when you grunge up something it makes it really compelling because it takes it out of that uncanny valley where it just looks too clean and too perfect and now you dirty it up a little bit and it looks more more organic here at the end I'm adjusting the color attributes I'm going to use a stochastic system to get some variation in the color output I chose red white and black to begin with and then I added the blue channel and when I added the blue channel it kind of took on a, a flag context so if you get that kind of feeling out of it it wasn't deliberate but that's just how it is I printed some mintings of this and it it really doesn't carry that context too heavily but if you were to put it in some kind of setting where there are those those cues those triggers then it would definitely take on that context but just keep in mind that your color is going to play a huge role in how th this texture plays out if you've been following the code you'll notice that I just made a boo-boo <laughs> That condition has um, an argument where it's greater than 0 divided by 55. So that's obviously a mistake. Division by 0 is not going to give you anything but an error in some cases. So that needs to be 0 
if you're following the code you can change that now I'll come back to it later because that's going to affect the output and I'll notice that it's not quite right okay so I'm gonna scroll up here to the top and completely miss that I haven't instantiated the object or assigned it to the thing variable even though I looked right at it I press play and I see that oh <laughs> that's not defined well why not because I need to assign to thing a new instance of thing maker function so let's do that here if you haven't already and let's press play and see what happens <laughs> Okay, and of course the output is not doing what it's supposed to. Remember when I said that it wasn't, that condition was messed up? Well, that condition is supposed to be taking away some of the output. It's drawing the black polygons. Well, there's no black polygons being drawn in here, so the output's accumulating, and it it's not really oversaturating because it is changing every frame, noticeably changing every frame. But it does seem really crowded and muddled. So using that degradation that removing the the black polygon is kind of an important step <laughs> in the output you can see here the difference that it makes that the gaps that white space that's a design principle using your white space to give you balance in the output can make it more compelling so here at the end I'm going to add a couple extra things the code is pretty much ready to go as you you see it here and again there's also links in the description but at the end, I wanted to add some procedures that will save this as a file. So if you're interested in that, here you go. I'm also going to use, uh, use some procedures to switch from full screen. So if you want to use this as a screen saver or any code as a screen saver, you'll have the procedures for that. I think these are in the example page on the P5JS website. But uh, if you don't want to wade through that, trying to find where it is, here you go right now. And while those are typing out, I kind of wanted to explain a little bit of a shift uh, in my tutorials bef before they've been focused on showing you the procedures and making sure you understand what's going on in P5JS. And that's great for beginners and all of that material is still there for everyone who wants to use it so that they can learn more and get stronger at their programming skills. But now I want to switch from being more coding focused to being more art focused because that's kind of what I am to begin with. I'm an artist and I'm using code to make art, but I also have a pretty strong background in code. So I'm like uh, in between both worlds here. But for a lot of you, you're not strong coders, but you're really good artists and you know design principles and you know how to get something to look really cool if you just could use the tools right. So I kind of want to find uh, a place between those two things. How can I speak to artists in artist terms and get them to relate that to the coding that they need to accomplish their goals? So that's kind of what I'm going to be doing uh, from here on in. I have an upcoming video. I know I promised this a couple weeks ago, but I've had to <laughs> I've had to rewrite the script a couple times because th I know what I'm doing in my head. I just do it automatically. But describing this process, this creative process to somebody else has been really challenging. I've had to be really introspective and pick out the steps, pretty much figure out what I'm doing in my head as a program. It's like a procedure itself. And then describe that in ways that others can use that information. The bottom line is it's a lot of work, it's a lot of energy, and it takes a lot of time to do. And I want to do it well. I don't want to invest all this time and energy and effort into something that's just going to confuse people, is going to be wrong, and isn't going to help anyone. So in order to just be right and do a good job, I'm taking my time with this. And I've had to write the script three times. I'm now on my third version. I think it's a little bit easier to understand. And the parts fit together a lot better. So it, it is well in line with what I'm doing. So I think if... If I can just describe what processes I'm going through, maybe that will help other people uh, step their way through the process and achieve um, more desirable results in their, in their design goals. Well, I guess that's it. Thanks for watching. I appreciate it. If you're subscribed, thank you so much for the support. If you haven't subscribed, I'd be honored to have your subscription. If you enjoy videos like these, I produce 
a video about once a week or so, sometimes more, sometimes less, but on average it's about that. Uh, hit the bell to be notified when those videos are dropped and uh, look for that fourth part that's going to begin to describe process structure and the methodology that you can go through to design your own generative system. So I hope you will join me for that. Until then, as always, thanks for watching and take care.